Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Click Wars. Jamie, how's it going, man? You well? It's very good, very good. Just a quick recap. We've got one of the, I'd say biggest, if you, like beyond even a new site, publishing giants on today. Uh, I've met him briefly in Manchester. He was nice enough to impart some serious wisdom when I met him. He's uh, the owner of some of the biggest sites, bar maybe future PLC, uh, in out of any gaming and uh, sort of PC hardware style conglomerates, ranking millions and millions of traffic. Um, and I'm really grateful for how honest uh, that Will was in giving us some really great information, recovering from losing, you know, 20, 20,000 clicks a day um, from losing snippets and the schema, the really deep levels into schema that you can do to try and make it easy as possible for Google to review to try and recover those. Big stuff on scaling affiliate teams to dozens and dozens of people with real big 7,000 square foot office space and entire creative teams. Uh, this was a bit of a banger, to be honest, and I'm really grateful that we got to deliver this one. So enjoy, everybody. This was an absolute, I was, I'm purely selfishly, I learned a lot and, you know, hope you lot do too. <laughs> I want a, I want horns there, like, <laughs> <laughs> right, let's get into it. Right, welcome to the next episode of Click Wars. I'm with Sammy and having talked to a lot of fantastic people, we've now got someone that you might not know as well, but has been operating on levels far higher than we could even fathom. One of the biggest in the game. Very, very honored to have him with his time to bless us with a presence and with probably the best background so far from any of the guests we've had. We'll have to get a quick uh, tour when you, uh, when you introduce yourself, Will. But yeah, thank you for coming and uh, being willing to talk with us today. Yeah, no worries. Uh, no pressure then uh, with that sort of introduction. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, willing to uh, share whatever I can share and hopefully someone will take some uh, key learnings from it. Nice. Um, so if people don't know about like your history in the game, you run some of the biggest, I would say some of the biggest sites in like the PC gaming type places. You can see the background with the dotted around with the, with the Lego and stuff like that. It gives a hint to the, to the, to the building you're operating on. Um, we don't typically do the history stuff, but for you, I think it's important. Like, so how do you go from starting from zero and going to one in such a, like a, like a lot of people think of the new site thing is like, I want to go and I want to be self-sustaining. I want to build these sites, but you've gone mm -hmm. and build like publishing big businesses with dozens of people and all this stuff. How do you scale up to that and manage it? Yeah, no, it's a good question because I, I think that's that's one of the funny things is like a lot of people move into the, the niche side game because they want a passive income, they don't want to have a boss anymore, they want their freedom and flexibility of being able to work and travel and all that stuff. Um, and then I think because of that sort of mentality, people kind of get stuck in thinking that's all, that's kind of where it's limited to, when in actual fact, all you're doing is taking one step of like a larger program, whereby a media publisher is just a, a larger example of what you're doing. Um, on a bigger scale so obviously because I started years and years and years ago um, after I saw my previous company which was a one-man band just myself living in South Korea at the time um, you know that was three or four years stretch of, of basically just Amazon Associates and then I kind of got into direct so working with ShareSale and some others but you know that was that was you know your typical niche site focusing on one niche and basically blitzing it out so I became a authority um, and um, and I, I kind of after that I was like right well I've done it once uh, it was really cool but one I was really lonely because this niche site game can can be really lon lonely. Like it's cool and stuff like working on your own in your boxes, and, but it gets to a point where you're just like, yeah, I want to actually talk to people. Like I want to be able to like talk shit about Amazon and stuff. And <laughs> sometimes you can't, you know, like after work, if you work in, in, in an office environment, you go to the pub at like five and start talking shit about your boss. You can't do that when you're like, doing a niche site because you're just basically talking shit about yourself um, <laughs> and, and there's no one to talk to. So, so yeah, the loneliness was one thing that I, I kind of was like, right, I need to, I want to work with other people and I like collab. Um, and then the other thing was a scale, uh, pure and simple working on your own, even if you have freelancers, even if you have a group, of, you know, a, a team, um, wherever they may be it can get, well, it does get pretty limited. You do end up bottlenecking yourself. And um, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of move away from that and see how 
big I could build something. Um, I, I also saw the industry was moving towards more authority, um, authoritative sites, you know, hands-on reviews, uh, video content, and all this other stuff. This was like uh, 2018, 2017, 2018, when I sold my my other business. Um, so I was like, well, you know, to have, to do hands-on reviews, to do all this stuff, I needed to have office space or at least have a decent logistics set up. Um, I needed to obviously have a team because I wasn't going to be able to do um, – the amount of product reviews I needed to do all by myself and I needed to start hiring experts in the field that I decided to go in so that's kind of where it started um, and it was more of a challenge to myself as well because I've managed people in the past and you know sometimes it's all right sometimes it's not um, I have a very like I'm very if if so I've got one guy in one of my teams and he's he's Actually, I don't want to say because if he listens to this, it's massively big-headed. But he's all right, and uh, he's the sort of person that, like, you can tell to do something once, and that's it. He goes and does it and learns. And if there's any any issues, he won't bother you. You'll just go and figure it out himself. If you're not that sort of person, <laughs> then I have a real hard time like managing those sort of people that need like that spoon feeding. Um, so yeah, so there, there was an element of management that I was just like, yeah, I want to I want to figure out how I can do this, and um, yeah, I kind of just went from there. Sorry, I digressed a little bit on that question. <laughs> no, that's good, man. I mean, what I noticed there, what you said, talk about management, I, I'm exactly the same as you, mate. I I have to, like, say it once, and then you guys can go and figure it out. Like, you should have the ability to be mm. able to do that. Like, what I found is when I've hired now, I try and hire the opposite of me, like, because I know I'm absolutely terrible at organizing mm. my life. Uh, so I find someone that's like super shit hot on that type of stuff because then it actually improves the business and the areas that it's like yeah. struggling in. Have you done that too? Yeah, yeah. So actually, um, when I started this business, uh, because I wanted to know that, I, because I wanted to go into business with other people, um, I'd come back from South Korea. I'd been back maybe a year or so. I'd moved back to near my hometown. So I used to live in London. I moved back to kind of Manchester area. So I don't really know that many people to kind of start a business with. So I kind of jumped in really fast uh, with two guys that I'd quite, you know, within six months met. Um, and the reason I did that was one, because I, I have a habit of just jumping into things. And, and two was because their skill sets was completely different to mine. So I thought at the very worst, there's going to be a, there's going to be very little overlap. So there's going to be stuff that I can do, which I'm really good at. Um, and then these two other guys, you know, they, they, they fit other areas. So I was like, you know, it should work pretty fine. Um, so we did it when I basically started the business. And then since then, obviously hiring people within the business. Um, yeah, we, I've hired a lot of people. I've had to hire a lot of people that have, or at least hope to have the same skill sets I have because I'm still a bottleneck. If we're running four or five sites, I can't be doing, I'm really good at keyword research, content planning, that sort of stuff, but I can't be doing that across five sites if we're trying to publish, I don't know, I don't even know how many words we publish, but let's say at least a million a month. There's no way I can do that. So I have to hire other people to ha that have the same qualifying skill sets that I have um, to kind of do it with me or do it for me. And um, for the founding team, how do you distribute that work over the main I guess the founding like uh, and who how do you make sure that you're not I guess stepping on each other's toes but also being as effective as possible yeah no, that's good uh good question so basically how it runs is so I so one of the guys is in charge of operations so he deals with HR um usually has first dabs at like things like contracts so we'll all review decent contracts because we have to really, but in terms of like having a first glance, he'll look at those, uh, see any CVs or HR hiring or HR issues he'll do with, um, in terms of investment side of things, uh, or loans or anything like that. He'll usually start with that. Um, again, a lot of the stuff that he works with kind of, we have to all jump in at some point, but he'll take care of the, the, you know, the form filling and all that rubbish, which at the end of the day is just not worth that much time. Um, the other guy, he, works uh in the tech side so he helps well he, he's basically been the guy who's been running the tech side of things so uh, the tech stack um 
any WordPress issues, any development that was needed, um, and building out a development team, which has been very, very, very difficult <laughs> and very expensive. Um, probably one of our, our hardest things. And then, and, and he also helps with the, me and him kind of do a lot of the financial side of things. So the forecasting and stuff, I like to do the forecasting and stuff like that, but then he'll throw it through a few sheets to, to make it look nicer. Um, and then board meeting decks, we all kind of, pitch into the board meeting decks each month uh and then investor relations he usually deals with most of that accounting he usually deals with most of that um and then that basically what i do is i acquire sites uh build sites grow sites optimize sites um i work i do all the e-commerce um i do when i say i do all the e-commerce the e-commerce is a shitload of stuff uh <laughs> like there's a lot um but i i do all the e-commerce and then basically do all the affiliate um well i don't do actually no, sorry i i oversee but we have head of contents and stuff who who help with all that stuff now so you know it's a big team so when i say i do it doesn't actually mean i literally get into the nitty-gritty and do everything because you're just never going to get through a day's work if that's the case um yeah that's kind of how it works at the moment. What does it look for you like on a day-to-day -day basis? Like you're coming in, you've got this big team, like what are you doing? Um, are you a very tight knit now? Are you still getting into page level like stuff still? How's it kind of set up for you? Yeah. Um, each day is a bit different. At the moment, so the e-commerce side of things is really big and it's growing quite fast. And it's something I started a few years ago as a side project during COVID, which we then integrated into the business. So I ran that from everything because it was just me. Uh, so I'm still really, really attached to that um, because of the growth aspect and also because I, I know everything. So I find it easier sometimes. I, I think everyone gets in this habit of rather than giving uh, work away, you actually hold on to it because it's easier for you to do it than it is to teach someone else when it short term it's like short term gain but long term it's just stupid and i i am aware that i still do that um so i you know like yesterday i had to like drive to smith's toy shop and had gotten a massive argument with the manager there because he wouldn't let me buy loads of toys so i had to <laughs> like I had to do like a click and click. So I was like, right. So he wasn't going to let me buy the toys in the shop. So I was like, right, well, I can just go online, do a click and click to this store. And then I can just collect them. So I was like, it makes no sense. Uh, but he was seeing his ass. So I had to do that. So that was a fun two hours or something. Um, what else did I do yesterday? I caught, well, I went for a one-to-one -one with one of the team, uh, took him to the pub for lunch just to catch up. Um, and then we had loads of web dev issues last week. Um, I've tried to move one of our servers to auto scaling server, which basically means when you get like peaks of traffic, like one of our sites does, um, rather than just basically the server just going, blah, it kind of scales up the server resources for when you need it and then scales it back down. Should have been a really easy, simple job, but as everything in tech, it never is. And it was, it literally caused me a massive headache for the last like six days. So that was doing that yesterday as well. So. Every day is different. Today, we have a, a live draw at 7 or 8 p.m., um, which I don't do Wednesdays anymore, but I'll, I'll make sure the guys are all sorted for that. I need to run through some some stuff with some of the content team. Uh, there's some new sites that I acquired recently that I really need, need to get get onto. So some like with the new sites, I'll do a lot of the keyword research, content planning, optimization, and I'll, I'll just get into the... I feel like it's always better to lead from the front sort of thing. Like, I like... I hate saying to people, go and do this if I won't do it myself. So if I have to, if, if they're busy as well, I'll just be like, right, let's chop it in half. You do this half, I'll do this half. We'll get it done. Like there's a batch of uh, content that was published, uh, sorry, that was written last week that needs to be published. And it's like the last batch before one of my guys can move on to another site. I was like, right, you just move on to the other site and I'll just do it today. Then he can just focus on the other side and not have to focus finishing off this work that I could probably quickly do in like an hour or two later this evening. So, yeah, it's uh, everything basically. And how does the um, how does the skill sets differ with ecom and affiliate? Like, like you've obviously mm -hmm. like you know you've acquired these skill sets and done really well and scaled content. And now, like you mentioned during COVID, that you started this new project that sounds like it's going really well. More on the ecom side. What's the difference in skill sets? What have you had to learn? And how does it, how does, I guess, 
the experience that some people listening might have in content lend itself to e-com? Yeah, so that's actually a really good question because there, there is a lot of areas where it does blend, but then there's a few areas where you're just like, what the fuck? Um, <laughs> like, obviously, when it depends as well because I think some people that get into niche sites and just affiliate and whatever, some of, some people are lucky to never have to touch like a name server or a, a server. You know, some some people have people to do that for them, which is great. But then once you're once you can do that sort of stuff, it's quite good because it means no matter what sort of website you need to launch, you can do the technical side of things. So the technical side of things, like obviously setting up WooCommerce and all that rubbish, is you know it's quite easy. But then the payment providers, obviously, pretty much no affiliate unless you're trying to pretend you're a com- commercial. Like unless you're trying to pretend you're a retailer, but in actual fact, you send people straight to um, Amazon or something. Not many people kind of have to deal with payment providers and all of that stuff. Um, so that was, it wasn't new to me this time because I've done it a few times before, but that is a new area which you have to learn. And it, it's pretty easy, but it can also be a little bit panicky when you're like, well, this one thing is responsible for driving revenue. So if I fuck it up, like it's a serious issue. Um, outside of that, though, obviously, it, with the e-commerce that we do, it's mainly driven through paid. Um, and then the the secondary is email. So, you know, once people are paid, obviously, we, we you know, do email marketing. So the email marketing, you know, done lots of that before with affiliate although i do find a lot of affiliates including us are pretty lazy at affiliate uh, uh, email marketing it's kind of always like a secondary thing and then i I always look back and go if i started this four years ago we'd have like a list of like a million people why didn't i do it and yet i still continue not to do it so it's one of those um so e- email is massive for us from an e-commerce perspective you know that returning visitor and and the the uh, the the value of that uh, visitor, that customer that we have is is huge, um, and then also we do a lot of paid media, so we do a lot of uh, paid social and paid um, search. So I used to do that in agency life, so I'm pretty familiar with that. Although to be honest, it's kind of developed a little bit since I did it, but um, yeah, we do that as well. You right. mentioned about paid social there. That's that's obviously a big big one to kind of ramp up e-commerce. Mm. Um, but it's changed a lot. How have you found ad rates recently? Yeah, no, it's it's changed massively. So so I started Facebook marketing back when it was like brand new. Um, I was actually part of the team that was basically when I used to work at agency, one of my clients was Nespresso. And um, they were like, when when Facebook was that big, they were like, oh, we want to hit 1 million like page likes because obviously that is a key metric. Um, so we were like, yeah, yeah, cool, we'll do that for you. So we did it for them. We got them 1 million page likes and, you know, they're really happy. And to be honest, it probably did add a lot of value back in that day. But things were way easier back then and way mm-hmm. cheaper. Nowadays, um, we find that our, our Facebook, it's, one, it's, it gets really expensive, especially to, depending on the type of um, audience targeting you're doing. Like our retargeting is so expensive compared to um to compare to just trying to funnel new people, new customer mm. acquisition. It's, bad, um, isn't it? it's, it's literally not wild, man. Now, yeah, the the big, the hardest thing right now is data is is tracking um, because of the iOS app issues uh, on Facebook, and also uh, this new analytics. I'm sorry, I just can't get my head around it. This new GA4, I just hate it. I think it's <laughs> absolutely horrible. Um, so tracking is a has been a big issue in the past, continues to be a big issue, actually gets more, it's a bigger issue now because we're doing more channels. Back when we were literally just doing Facebook, so 95% of our traffic was coming through Facebook, at least I could pretty much say confidently if we spent 50 grand and drove 100 grand in sales that month, then it's probably going to be Facebook. Whereas now, because we're doing AdWords and YouTube and obviously we have a lot of email, direct, SMS, we're starting to do offline advertising, it's like, well, I need to be able to track all these things even more so than I used to. Uh, so that is kind of one thing that's on my agenda right now is trying to find an actual decent tracking solution that's half accurate, you know, give us a le- at least some decent guidance. Um, and then also attribution modeling because at the moment, a lot of our sales are being um, reported as like organic or direct, which is bollocks. So I need, I've been playing around with the attrib- attribution modeling. Uh, it's basically a heavier way, uh, some of our paid channels, because I know, because I've run the business for three years, I don't care what the tracking says. I know that that's responsible for the sales. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's lots of stuff. Nice. To bring it back to email for a second, mm. um, just as like, let's just like give an example. Let's say you've got a site that's doing well, it's to say, let's make in, in revenue, you're doing like a 10 grand a month, standard niche site type thing. And you've got 10,000 on the email list. It's a decent list style niche for affiliate 
and they're not doing any email marketing at all. It's a big hole, right? If you yeah. are in that position based on what you know for what works, based on what you've tested with the e-com learning as well, what would you do uh, in terms of setting up a strategy, content plan, how often style things to turn that into a revenue generating income stream for that site? It's a pretty broad question because <laughs> in my head, I'm thinking, well, okay, like, if it's like a kitchen site, then obviously diet recipes and all that stuff is great for, for building the, the, the customer list. But then I'm thinking, well, I used to have a mattress site, so I never did it, but I wish I did. But one of the things I would have done back then is most people who buy mattresses, they go on to buy bedding and pillows and all the other stuff, especially back when it was like bed in the box was booming because everyone was like, ooh. Uh, so they'd go and buy pillows and stuff, and pillows are bloody expensive. So back then, I would have loved, I should have got a, it, it's always the same classic, like it's always something free to obviously get them to sign up always, or like a discount code, but most times you can't actually offer a discount code. Um, and then it's kind of like for that, it's for me, it's cross-selling. So it's an upselling, obviously. Um, which works really well. Um, also, like now and back in the day, now even more so, even with this current business we've got, is selling space in the newsletters to direct um, clients of ours. We have done that in the past, um, especially over Q4 when Black Friday's here and all that, and everyone's you know selling and doing promotions. We've sold um, ad space in, in newsletters before. Um, the actual strategy though really depends on the niche. I think, like. Yeah, I mean, again, going with a kitchen thing, because I do have a kitchen site, I just don't work on it. But one thing I'd love to do is weekly recipes, which I know is so like, well, it doesn't really make any money. Of course it doesn't. But it's just building that rapport, building that relationship with your customer. So then when you do slap them with the deal, they're not just like, who the hell is this guy? Um, yeah, I think a lot of way too many people just, including us, because we are not very good at email, except for the e-commerce side of things our affiliate and you know the media publishing side of the business we don't do email very well at all um so it, it's something we need to get better at um it is actually something we're doing more so now because of the whole um uh, drop of cookies so obviously because ad networks are starting to i can't remember what it is but there's something to do with email basically if we've got the email then we can it, we get better value from our ad providers so that's something we're doing more of. We're actually starting to, well, we're waiting to finish developing a um, single sign-on across all of our sites um, because apparently we can plug that into some of our data providers um, and some of our ad networks and get better value from our, 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 just get better RPMs and stuff. So there's even more value outside of just having an email list simply to send people an email. The, the data side of it is probably even more valuable than ever. How do you balance it in terms of like um, value to sell? Like what's the ratio you'd go with and also um, frequency? Like how often do you think people should be emailing their list? Yeah, the frequency, again, depends on what it is you're providing. Um, you know, I've, all, I've always wanted to do a finance block, always, because it's something that's never going to... Yeah, <laughs> you know what? I saw your Twitter as well. Um, and like, I was like, this guy, this guy, I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, but like... <laughs> I've always wanted to do it because it, it's it's one of those like it, it's never gonna it's never gonna die. People are never gonna be like, yeah, I don't actually want to know how to make more money or save more money or anything <laughs> like that. And like with something like that weekly, it, you know, it's, e it's quite easy to feed people decent information each week. Um, obviously, we're in gaming and we can do gaming deals and stuff like that and gaming reviews and stuff. We should really just have a. I'd say if we're properly doing it once a week has to be the probably minimum, but probably would be where we'd leave it or maybe twice a week if we had deals. Um, but it also depends if you're segmenting. So what we've talked about, like building it in the past is we'd like to segment it based on obviously gamers are very specific about what they like. You know, I don't want to be talking to an Xbox gamer about PlayStation because they'll just like try and hang me or something. So mm -hmm. it's like, I, I really want to be able to segment our audience list specifically to what they like so we can cater the emails towards them and i think sometimes that's more important than just sending out a blanket email each week just to you know build up that rapport it's way easier it's way better if it's more personalized um it's something we're working on at the moment as part of the single sign up i completely agree with you man like it's one i'm doing that at the moment so i'm saying like every league magma has se separate tags and i know the digital products which are more suited to that person so we're then firing the deals at those guys to then put in the sales because it makes a lot more sense you're exactly mm -hmm. right like xbox playstation two different, very different people investors savers and budgeters again two different mindsets two different types of people and disposable income essentially so yeah. you've got to think like that and 
if you can segment your data early, do it. It's quite easy these days to set up tags in the back of these mailer platforms. And I would always have them running because you never know when you're going to want them. And one of the things I noticed about, I had a quick dig interview your sites. So you're doing a lot of similar like reviews across gaming. Mm. Is this to kind of cement yourself as a kind of authority throughout, you know, one, two, three, four? listing yeah. is that is, is that is that literally the play on and and, and you know, do you want to talk to us a little bit about that yeah yeah i mean yeah basically it's just like like you'll look at some of the surfs and it's just like we're one two three and it, but it's the same tactic <laughs> I did, I did use, <laughs> you know all the big media publishers use the same tactics you know yeah. I, I know glenn in the past you know glenn from detail.com and all that stuff yeah. like he's he's mentioned it millions of times about you know all these big and, and they are like our next level we are kind of on that level but we're like so small to them they will probably just acquire us at some point but they are like they do it all the time and um it's just like well if they're doing it why don't we do it um it, it is a, a case of we want to solidify our, our place in the serps um <clears throat> but it's also because sometimes the site that should rank won't rank as well as one of our other sites and it, it makes no sense to me sometimes like our specific site that's like fundamentally about video gaming might not rank about a video game as well as a hardware site that we have and it's just like well that makes no sense. Um, so it's kind of also just to, to, I guess, protect ourselves, making sure that we actually at least rank once. Um, it's something we will probably continue to do, but one thing we've, we've hired a guy recently from Corsair who's uh, working on one of on our main ha hardware site. And his, his um, approach now is basically to go over all of our content and overhaul everything. And we're going to be taking that site a completely different, well, back to its roots, back to doing very high authority, very thorough, uh, detailed reviews and, and our, we're revamping our whole on whole hands-on testing procedure and all of that stuff. So we, we've kind of come a little bit away from that recently when we've been chasing all these SERPs, but it, it gets to the point where you kind of like, you do, you just get a bit addicted to chasing rankings and traffic. <laughs> Yes, that's why we're here, man. It's called Click Wars. Yeah, well, um, yeah, well, yeah. I noticed as well that you occasionally interlink the sites. Will you do that within, let's say, with one specific review? Um, we don't tend to do, if we've got the same content on multiple sites, we don't tend to do internal linking across for those particular pages or anything. Um, what we do do is we do have footer links across all of our, most of our sites, like portfolio foot links, um, which I know has been chatted about for like the last 15 years. And you know, some people have been like, oh, it's bad. Some people have said it's good. Obviously, what we don't do is we don't have a foot link that says like best PS5 game. And yeah. Goes, yeah, we're not we're not that stupid. We just have our brand names. Um, I think <laughs> I'm just thinking that. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think I th I'm pretty sure. Disclaimer, might, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Other than that, we do we do internal linking if like because we've got gaming specific sites, we do internal link like if we're talking about like I don't know the best TV for console gaming, we might internal link that. To, oh, sorry, I keep saying internal link, but we might link that to one of our other sites, our sister sites. Um, it's something our internal linking and general linking procedure for linking across our portfolio is pretty holy at the moment and i don't mean in the uh, religious sense just in the strategic sense uh because we're hiring people all the time it's yeah our sops are not great in that area right now something to work on so um you mentioned um before i believe issues with feature snippets and losing them and bringing mm. them back and recovery when you lost those what was your i guess strategy and plan in terms of like this is what we think diagnose issue and how do you recover it and what do you think the difference maker was for anyone else that's lost sniffers listening uh so initial reaction is panic <laughs> <laughs> like it's uh, it, i mean I, anyone that's been in these sites or had sites for for a few years and will go on to continue you, this will happen to you at some point you will lose traffic like it happens um and it is the most horrible thing in the world it's because it's out of your control ultimately if you're relying on google seo yeah you don't have full control um what we that was so that was february i want to say last year but it could have been a year before it was 
the years just merged together for me, but it was February last year or the year before. Um, <clears throat> what we initially did was we went over our entire schema because we'd been switching from two different plugins. I can't remember the plugins, but there's two really popular schema plugins. And we'd been switching between the two because one of them was way better at majority of stuff, but we couldn't get to the point where we had a nested schema. We couldn't build nested schema through it. So we switched to another one. So we automatically thought, shit, well, we've, we've, we've screwed up somewhere. So we tested a load of pages, put them all through the schema test thing. Everything was fine. <coughs> And then we just had to go through a checklist one by one by one by one by one, trying to figure out what it was. And to be honest, and, and we kept resubmitting it um, uh, to Google as well. Um, <clears throat> and to be honest, it got to the point whereby it had been six months and we'd heard somewhere, I don't know, it was one of my business partners, he'd read somewhere, heard somewhere that after six months, apparently it just goes away, it like expires. And it was it was almost six months to the day where it just suddenly reappeared. And because of all the improvements we've made on the schema during those six months, because we, we were working really hard on getting nested schema, because we knew, I think everyone knows now, it's pretty obvious, but Google loves, obviously, data. They love a, a site that's been schemified to the absolute max because it allows them to do all these different, especially now with like SGE, it allows them to do all these different things and just literally just take the data they need. Um, and we we did all that, and, and when we actually ended up getting back in uh, the snippets, we you know our traffic went up more than it was when we lost it. So it was fine, but we we lost so much traffic because I think it was losing like it was like fifteen thousand clicks a day or twenty thousand clicks a day, which was a lot. And it was it was for really like really affiliate specific keywords, so it was like a lot of revenue. Uh, so it wasn't a great time, but it's what it is. And um, just uh, to, all right, I've got two things that's really interesting. I've got uh, the schema. What schema, apart from what you mentioned, nested schema, um, you've obviously done your research. You've gone deep into what you can add to get yourself uh, uh, an advantage over competition. What are the schema that you would recommend other people that don't usually uh, utilize, they can add to get better results? And two, I'd love to hear more in depth about the other things you did to get the snippets back, like the other improvements. Yeah, sure. So... So the skip, what what I recommend everyone doing is everything. Um, <laughs> so so we didn't have how to schema at the time. Oh, we did, but it, it how to schema is such a pain in the ass because you obviously have to literally every step put into the schema. Which when we were like doing that, and it was like, yeah, we've got like three hundred how to pages, and we have to go. But I mean, I didn't do it. <laughs> Someone else did. Uh, I was like, yeah, guys, you've got a week. Go and deal with this. Um, <laughs> which, yeah, I mean, some of the guys are like almost putting guns to the head by the end of it because uh, it, it's not fun. But it was basically we had no, we didn't have proper how to scheme at the time, so it was fixing all the minor issues. Like if you go on like GSC and you see some of the like yellow warnings, like not the, not the really not the red ones basically i can't remember what the yellow ones are called we were fixing everything so we we fixed all our how-to schema we had major issues with main entity for um i think it was for faqs the main entity just kept wasn't working properly so we just we spent weeks i think trying to figure out how the main ent why the main entity wasn't pulling through um article schema then we was also it was trying to figure out what the best schema is because one of the one of the concerns i had during that was on our best of guides was was we was 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 we using the wrong schema because i know in the past like years and years ago when i used to have my own shitty sites i used to use product review schema because obviously you get the five star and it's obviously improves your ctr i'm not an idiot i don't do that in a massive media publishing business but i was concerned at the time like maybe there was a few pages with the five star product review schema on our best of guide which isn't really allowed so we we went through that we didn't actually find any but we went through all that made sure all of our best of guides i think we ended up going with article schema um and then we just had obviously uh, organizational business schema i'm sorry i might be getting some of the terms wrong but you'll find them and then obviously author schema is a big one as well um and then our single product views we had to go through all of them because we were finding that a lot of our product review boxes weren't picking up the schema for whatever reason so we had to redo all of that um which was fun um and then stuff like date which i don't even think it's classified as schema date is it i don't know it's just i don't know if it is or not i can't remember but, yeah. updated or published i think for the date yeah so mm. the date issue we had loads of date issues which we went through that we found that comments so 
Google's got a weird thing with dates, man. Like, for a company that's so intelligent, they're pretty dumb. Like, they don't find the right date sometimes. We had loads of issues with um, Twitter embeds. So Google was pulling a date from a Twitter embed in our posts. Um, so we removed Twitter embeds, which was a bit annoying because they're actually quite useful. Um, comments. So Google is pulling comment dates as sometimes a date of a published or whatever. Um, so we removed comment dates. Um, basically, we got to the point where we were trying to remove every single date except for the published last, last updated date so we could improve the chance of our the real date coming up. It's, it's worked better, but it's still pretty pretty poor. Um, Google just doesn't seem to get its shit together with that. Um, other schema, though, uh, how to FAQ. Uh, I'd open up in a tab, but I can't open tabs otherwise I'll break the Play the bloody screen, uh, <laughs> and then yeah, main ent- main entity, organizational author. Um, trying to think what else we have. Editor, no, we've not tried editor. Oh, we've got pros and cons, pros and cons schema, or where we've got snippets, um, and then video thumbnails, which I know is not really schema, but it, it allows you to get into the video search. Um, that's a big thing. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. There might, there might be some other ones that we've been playing around with. Uh, a good a good website to look at is, um, it's not very, what's it called? Uh, what's the uh, dot .dash? What's one of their main sites? So look at very dot well .dash. Fit. Very well fit. Yeah, they do really good schema. And actually, that's thanks to a guy who told me about that. So I don't want to take credit for it if he listens to this other. But he told me about it. They have a very, very, really good schema uh, layout. So we kind of looked at theirs and compared it like what their best ofs had versus what ours had and basically filled in the gaps. Yeah, right. .dash do a lot of really good stuff. How do you scale content over big teams, multiple websites without losing quality? And yes. like what systems in place do you have for quality control there? Because for me, I'm the bottleneck and I still have too much of an imprint and I'm the reason that we're not scaling up quicker. And I've, I guess I, I have a tendency to micromanage it a little bit with the editing and stuff. How do you let that go? And how do you build a team whilst not dropping quality to the levels that you are happy with? Mate, you tell me. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, such a, it's, it's so hard. It's, I mean, it, is, it, it never gets easier. I, I, yeah, it never gets easier. Um, we, we've built systems and this, so we tackle it a few different ways. So it, obviously it depends on the type of content. So the type of content, obviously, we have like templated structures of, uh, you know, how to write that type of page. And then we have that across all of our websites. But then that has changed through different managing editors and different head of contents and all that coming in. So some of them have come in and then gone out <laughs> and it's all else coming. So things change all the time. Um, but yeah, we have those sort of standard templates for freelancers and for our individual writers. Our product review, like hands-on product reviews, have gone through loads of iterations and are currently going through another iteration. Uh, we found with our product review hands-ons, something like a laptop, like it would take two days for a guy to review a laptop. It's like, that's two days of cash that I have to pay this guy. And he's not re- he's not published a single word yet. I'm like, and, and a single product review on a laptop might get a thousand visits over a month. And it's just like, it will never work out. So. We've had to balance it whereby, because what we go to, we go to our audience and ask our audience what do they want to see. Like with some of our, with some of the stuff that we're really good at, like laptops and monitors, and ninety-five percent of people will want maybe sixty percent of the stuff that is requested. But then it's that five percent of people that want everything, and it's just like, well, we've just got to the point where it's like, well, we can't. Like I can't go and tell my guy to basically dismantle this laptop so you can find out exactly where each component is built and by what brand it's like that'll take four days it's like it'll cost thousands of pounds it's just not going to happen so with our single product reviews we've had to compromise and come up with a a a review process that is thorough enough um, for our users thorough enough that it adds and shows the legitimacy and the authority to google and our users um and to our clients, if we're working with a brand on that particular review or something, then you know whatever they request, obviously we need to make sure we've added into it as well. And it needs to it needs to be balanced and also to the point where if someone goes on one of our best of guides, when they click through to all the single product reviews of those best of recommendations, they're all consistent, which is again another thing we're we're working on fixing at the moment because 
throughout the years, one person might work on a laptop with you and then another person. So that's an issue as well. Um, other things like our informative content, like our how to's and stuff. Um, it's, it's, we used to go through a process where we would have professional photography. It's like we'd always get our creative team to do the photography. We've now pulled that back because we, a few reasons, but one is we feel like Google is Google and the, and the user. Like we used to do really good photography, like to the point where it would look like it came from the brand and that's not always great because it also means when someone looks at it they're like well it's not even your photography um mm. because people are a bit stupid sometimes you might not see our brand logo in the background or anything um so now we've gone back to like doing more um less professional like iphone camera photography um which speeds up the process and also alleviates some of the pressure on the content of the creative team sorry um and uh, we kind of feel like google might not reward us for it but they won't punish us for it and i think users might actually prefer it um so stuff like that we've changed um yeah so it depends on the kind of, kind of content like our game guides um are it depends if we get a game under embargo like we we got a uh, starfield like a few weeks ago so obviously we've got i don't know like 100 plus game guides going out for that today i think um so with that we've got like original print screens screenshots and videos and all that stuff um so yeah it really depends if, if we've got something on, under embargo we can build out a way better template if we've not got it under embargo and we're chasing our tails sort of thing then we need to be a little bit quicker and probably to the to the um detriment of some of the quality that's so cool man it um what about social because I'm seeing a lot of gaming, like there's some really cool like retro gaming channels I'm following at the moment. And it's mm. so much fun, like banging in the old PS1 games and like they put it up on like massive giant screens in theaters and stuff like that. And like playing Tekken, it looks sick. Yeah. Like what are, you, what are you doing in that space? Is it something you're, you're conscious of and driving traffic with or is it, is it not a play? Social is like, it's been like that, second priority for like four years it's it's like we know how important it is uh, um we know there's businesses that are literally just built on social even in our space you know obviously um social chain used to have massive gaming network obviously yeah. sold, but like social chain lad bible i think they still have gaming bible um and, and all the other ones like there's a shitload of money to be made and it it we've we've was tickled with it sort of thing like we played around with it a little bit and it does work the rpms and cpms are dog shit compared to organic yeah. seo which you do have to factor in because some people forget like oh i can get ten thousand visits from facebook well yeah but those ten thousand visits from facebook are worth like four dollars <laughs> whereas the ten thousand visits from google are worth like way more so there's there's things like that that you need to kind of factor in but there's a few things like for google discover it's really really helpful we've we found that quite a lot and i think lots of people are aware of that now that the social sort of signals uh, help with google discover um but it, to answer your question bluntly it's, it's not something we actually have a fully built robust team to to drive at the moment with you know we have like our, our video game our social um social facebook i don't even know how many followers on that but probably not that many to be honest um but it is something we're trying to get back into but it's, we don't have a person in in-house to really focus on it and if even if we had one person it's kind of well where do you choose them to focus on because it's got like five or six brands uh so yeah it's uh it's an afterthought which is not great but we'll get that it's good to have the opportunity there yeah yeah i think that's going to lead into like one of our next questions really which is like what is next you've built this media company you've touched on socials there as a as a point of improvement but like where else can you go just so much like i mean the social is is massive it could double triple our, our business if we wanted going back to the the content organic seo play we ain't perfect we have so many issues like we have so many like little affiliates who are our rankers on long tail stuff we've got to the point where i used to look at future and go you guys are shit because i'd be able to like outrank them with a little shitty site and people are doing that to us because you get to the point where you have so much content especially in in a tech and gaming space because it isn't evergreen, not much of it is evergreen. So you, mm. it needs constant updating, um, obviously peaks and troughs of gaming, uh, the hardware needs constant, constantly updating. So there's loads of improvements we can make there. And we're, we're not good enough yet, whereby we are competing with the primary keywords that we would like to rank for. 
um, you know, that future are ranking for and a few of the other guys. So there's millions and millions of visits there that we can get. Tools, we don't, our, our dev team's just about kind of built, but it's taken a long time. So there's a lot of tools that we need to build. Um, we still have one of our sites on an old .NET, which we're trying to replatform at the moment, which has been an absolute piece of crap for like the last nine months. <laughs> um, there's there's so much stuff we can do. So much stuff we can do. Um, you know, we were really big on TikTok when TikTok came out, and we are still really big on TikTok, and that's that's been great. But but building that into a channel to drive traffic has been not so great so there's lots of improvements to be made there um and that's just that's just kind of just playing with stuff that we already have like there's stuff we can build that we don't yet have or there's there's brands out there that we could acquire or, or launch that we don't yet don't yet do um and that's even just in our niche you know we could expand outside of our niche um there's lots of stuff going on that i can't talk about but yeah <laughs> that's some of the stuff yeah i um for my you know my niche we've spoken about this privately but for the main keyword for that i'm 13th at the moment and i'll never go mm -hmm. higher because on that top 10 it's five future sites and it's like for yeah. fuck's sake man just give me a break let me i used to be like seventh but you just can't it's impossible unless there was a dr90 site to compete realistically there yeah i mean yeah i'd need to see it again that but like one of our main, main or one of the main keywords that I've wanted to run for for years is like best gaming monitor, which we were like 13th. And I think now we're maybe like 11th or something. And it's basically future that like smashed the top three, top five positions. But they're, they're, most of their sites are like DR 80s, 90s, like an ours or DR 70, 75 or something. So link wise and stuff, we're, we're pretty far behind, but I do think we can get there. I do, I do think it is possible for smaller sites to, to compete with these guys. Um, I just think it takes way, way, way more effort than they need to put in. Like we, we've, we've hired people from future and stuff. And sometimes I think they forget how easy it is for them on their, on their previous sites to rank and like how much more of a grind it is when you go to a smaller player. Um, and it isn't just hit the publish, like you need to do other stuff. Like there's a lot more to it. How do you build links at scale like that? Yeah, I knew you was gonna ask about link building and like, <laughs> we don't do link building. So that's probably why we don't rank for best gaming monitor. Like we don't, yeah, we've never done it. It's, it's, um, yeah. I don't really? know. Really? DR75 mm -hmm. plus naturally? Well, not naturally, but obviously when we acquired them, that's kind of where they were. They, they, we get quite a lot of organic links. Like we got Google like linked to us. This was a few years ago, but like Google linked to us from one of their uh, official blogs. Um, we have a lot of, we get a lot of really good links for free um, naturally. Um, and it actually surprises me sometimes because I hate, back when I was like building these sites, I'd hate those bloody blogs. I'd be like, just write the content and the links will come. <laughs> Such bollocks. I'm sorry, but it, it ain't happening. Like for the majority of people, that is not going to happen. Um, you do have to yeah. build links generally. But, but it's really about how you build links. We do get links from brands. So the, you know, when we do like a Asus ROG uh, what this chair is review, you know, they might link to us from their Asus Rob chair review product page. Um, you know, so we get those sort of links. Uh, we've done quite a lot of uh, interviews in the past and stuff about like our shareholder investments and stuff, but they are like more business blogs. So it's not really relevant to our specific niche. We get those sort of links. Um, specific niche links to, to our sites, we don't really do because the guys that would be have, the links that we'd need to knock on the doors to get, our future and the other guys because i don't really see the, per the the benefit in getting like a dr30 or dr50 site linking to us like we need dr 80s and 90s and not many people that i actually want to talk to <laughs> have those sort of sites like there's no point going to like pc game and be like yo link to us i mean they do link to us but i, I don't really want to ask them um so yeah there's that as well i just feel like one or two links might not move the needle too much. Um, but having said that, there is specific pages where we do want primary keyword rankings where those specific pages don't have enough link juice because we haven't done that. So yeah, it's one of those things that we'll get to at some point. Nice. Um, I won't keep you too long. I know you've got stuff to do and we're coming to the end of this, but just as a last sort of, I guess, a philosophical thinking about the future, where mm. is it going? What's the landscape? Um, 
what do you think one about sg and the future of ai and such and two what are you most worried for and excited about for the landscape for you where your business operates in organic and everything else over the next 12 months uh so, so i so i try and not look to I, I try not think too much about the general landscape and where it's going on i know that's probably a stupid thing because i run a media publishing business but it's it's one is out of my control and two i've got other stuff to worry about like <laughs> like it would keep me up, up at night if i start worrying about like like the, everything everyone on twitter and stuff like panicking about sg i'm just like I'll, I'll i'll figure out when it happens one thing i did notice is we got a ton of traffic to our also pages and i think it's because um i'll see yes the new google search experience um thing has um links to the author profiles in a lot of the quotes that they use and stuff so i feel like that's because we we get lo- we always get like 50 visits real time on like one of our author pages I was like dude have you become famous like what's going on <laughs> and we couldn't we couldn't figure it out we we thought it was spam but it wasn't spam and then i was like right have we screwed up a page or something couldn't figure anything out and i was like i think someone had put something on twitter and i saw like a print screen a screen, screenshot of it and I was like you know what it might be that and it was about the same time it started happening so in terms of the general landscape it, where where do I think it's going I mean I, obviously AI, AI is going to be integrated to, into everything I think you know that's a given but in our niche AI can't give you a, I mean in any niche AI can't give you opinions and I'm sorry but the, no matter what you're going to be writing about and what niche you're going to get into oh shit sorry um everyone everyone including google wants opinions so it, even like recipes where you, you can go and ask you know google bard or chat gpt to give you like a nice chicken stir fry recipe or something like that. and yeah there you go you got a recipe but there's no like like if i do a few recipes myself and i was like it's so specific about like if it says to i, don't, I can't think of a good example but like you know, you know, like like her mother's recipes and stuff. Like there's always little bits which are different, and it's because of those years and years of experience of of cooking that recipe or ch- changing that recipe, and also stuff like um, I'm trying to think of an example. But like, well, did I, I made a cheesecake the other week? So like, I'm trying to think of an example of a cheesecake because I can't think of one. But basically, there's always little bits where you can be like author box notes, where it's like, yeah, it says to do this, but actually I find it better to do this and this and this. And it's those yeah. things that AI is never going to be able to do ever. So can't I'm not taste. too worried about that. Can't, can't taste exactly. Um, mm. And in gaming, gaming guides, like AI is not going to be able to give you a walkthrough to find a certain jewel in a certain game. Um, well, maybe not yet until it can actually play the game and then write it, which will be pretty <laughs> insane. So yeah, I'm not too worried about that. I guess I get the informative ones are a little bit concerning because there's a lot of long tail where it'll be like, you know, like really long tail keywords, like a lot of like the programmatic SEO. And and that obviously problematic SEO is in every industry. Like you can find that sort of stuff everywhere. I'm a little bit worried about that, but at the same time, I feel like as long as we can get our dev side together and we can start building out better data for Google to use, then they'll still be applying our data to whatever they produce on on their Google search experience, which is another reason we're trying to build out all this schema. So, and we're in a pretty good place pre Q4, so. When we're in a good place pre Q4, it's like, yeah, Q4, is good. we're going to smash it. So I'm excited about Q4, which is obviously this year. Outside of that, though, I'm excited about what we can do from a development perspective once we've really figured out what development resource we've got. We've hired like five new developers, but it seems like every time we hire new developers, half of them don't work out for whatever reason. So that's an ongoing battle, but I'm excited about what we can do with those developers. Um, I'm, I am excited about the team that we've built. I think we're in a really good place. Uh, you, as with any business, you go through hiring people that just don't quite work out. And I think at the moment, we've got a pretty solid team um, and a, a few really solid people who are like properly bought into the business and stuff. I'm excited about where they can take the business in the little areas that they're working in. Um, and we've we've got some really good relationships with Amazon um and some of the other big players so you know there's a lot of stuff going on there that's uh quite interesting as well nice man i think there's so much in that for people hopefully if you if you like, like last little one there if if you're listening to this and thinking wow like you know that's levels above and you know it is uh what would you say to that that little guy that's listening to this mate i was that little guy once that's what that's what I think is so cool about this. Like, I, I love this. I love niche size. I love this whole market, this whole industry. Because 
there is no ceiling. Like there is literally no ceiling. And like I'm I'm farther more aware that there's people out there doing way bigger stuff than I'm doing at earlier ages and whatever. Like you know, there's always gonna be people doing more successful things. There's always gonna be someone with a nicer car and all that rubbish. Um <laughs> Well, maybe not a nice Maybe car. not than you, mate. I've seen some of the ones you're rocking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it's like, it's like, so I started like when I was like 15 or 14 or 15 or something like, and the barriers to entry have not really changed that much. I feel like these affiliate sites, the barriers to entry have, have, have got better slightly. Like they've got a little bit more, like the investment needed into content. Like you, I mean, to be honest, AI actually kind of helps balance with that sometimes a little bit, but it has got to a point where you can, you know, push out crap quality content as much as you used to be able to. Um, but the bias entry in, in starting up is still so, so small relative to every other industry where you can build a six, seven, eight figure business. Like it's just, it's, it's not even comparable. So to the little guy, just keep going. Like I, I, my, my favorite saying has always been persistence is the key to success and I, I truly believe that and i truly believe that more so in this industry whereas i'm I, no matter what if you start an affiliate site you will make money at some point like it's just guaranteed everyone that i know that still does this from like 2006 2005 when i started they're all like making serious cash because they've been doing it for so long like it just happens you just I, yeah you can't fail as long as you put in all the effort it's that thousand hours thing that they always say. I think it's really resonates, especially like more in so in this industry mm. than anything else. Yeah, it does. It's the yeah. reps, reps, man, stick the reps in, you'll get there. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah really I love this, man. I've loved this. It's been so good, mate. Um, yeah. Where can people find you if they want, want to say hello, or if you don't want them to say hello, then no worries. Manche- <laughs> Manchester. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just have like a line of people outside the office. Um, <laughs> Twitter, I guess. Like, I do hang around Twitter. I, I just, I'm not very social, like, <laughs> like online or offline. Um, I'm just like, yeah, because I, I feel like there's so many people that say so many good things. I'm just like, I, there's nothing else I can add. Like, it's just, meh. I don't no, want to no just be that guy that just says like, stuff. No one's offering like you are. Do you have a lot to say on there that people would find valuable? Yeah, but I also don't want to say too much because then everyone will be like, oh, look at this motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm scaling yeah. back my uh, Twitter outreach at the moment because I keep getting fucking hit. So I'm like, right. <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard balancing it, though, right? Like, yeah. It really it's is. I'm building in public, man. It's fucking dangerous, man. But uh, it is, so I'm it just is. not saying anything at the moment. And then it's just going to basically be clip wars spam hardcore for the next week. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, t- Twitter is probably the best. Um, I am going to try and be more vocal soon like, when I get a chance. I do actually want to start doing stuff again. It's just like I used to do ages ago. I think, was it after I sold my site or before? All right, around about the time I sold that mattress site, I, I think I started doing some stuff. Um, but I, there was no real, I, I didn't have the right drive. I was just kind of doing it full time. So it wasn't the right headspace. But I'd like to start again at some point. I just need to make sure I've got the time to do it properly. Nice. Sick. No, watch out YouTube when you come flying in then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> we'll see. I need to do an office tour. I want to put that on Twitter. Yes. That'll yes. be fun. I want to see that. I want to see that. Yeah. I might do it on Friday, actually, when everyone's in for the social. I might just do it when everyone's pissed. But we... <laughs> yeah, yeah, do yeah. it, man. It's like that yeah. epic gardening style Twitter thing. Yeah, it's like, yeah. look at my house. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Loved I will it. do it. I'll do it, on, I'll do it on Friday when everyone's drunk. That'll be more fun. <laughs> yeah, buzzing. All right, cheers, man. Thanks a lot for coming on. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank no you. No worries. Much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Mm.